today we are going to discuss a lecture that I call the history of heresy and look a little bit at some of these ancient errors that began to develop in 2nd and 3rd century church history. The roots of some of these actually go all the way back into the 1st century, and I have this lecture there on week number 3 of the Jewel homepage. If we actually go back, and you don't need to uh, link to this, but if we go back to the first lecture that we did on why it's important to study church history, I made some points about the importance of church history with regard to not only the history of truth, but also the history of error. And we see in the New Testament, of course, Christ himself promised in Matthew chapter 7 and other places that there would come false prophets, that false prophets would arise. According to Matthew chapter 7, you will know them by their fruits. And of course, in the book of Jude, in the book of 2 Peter, especially the second chapter, and in other places in the New Testament, we have those fruits articulated by the apostles. In Acts chapter 20, as Paul is saying his tearful farewell to the Ephesian elders at Miletus, he tells them to be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Uh, even before this, after he had visited the Thessalonians, you know that he told the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22, that whenever somebody comes claiming to be a prophet or with a word of prophecy, at a time in church history when prophecy was still being given, Paul instructs them to test all things or to examine all things carefully and to reject that which is evil but to cling to that which is good so even in the first century context there is the possibility in fact the reality of false teachers and false doctrine that threatens the church first timothy 4 1 the spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And he goes on to describe some of the legalistic ways in which false teachers will seek to control those under their power. 2 Timothy 4.3, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth, turn aside to myths. Jude 17 and 18, you beloved ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were saying to you in the last times there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. So Christ and the apostles set a warning, set the precedent in warning the church of the first century to be on their guard against the reality of false teachers. And as we study church history, we quickly see that in the earliest generations and the earliest centuries of the history of the church, there arise false teaching and false prophets who threaten the doctrinal integrity of those who would follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Christians are forced, because of these false teachers, to defend sound doctrine. And as they defend that sound doctrine, they then articulate the truth. And many of those doctrinal creeds that we were just talking about are the result of attacks from false teachers on the truth and a response to those false teachers by those who hold fast to the apostolic teaching. A little later in this first lecture that we gave, we talked about how studying church history equips us to be faithful apologists. And I think this lecture in particular is helpful in that regard because when we understand a little bit about the history of heresy, we equip ourselves for dealing with false teachers who still plague the church in the 21st century. 
Titus 1, 8 through 10, one of the qualifications for being an elder in the church is that you are able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. So studying error in order to refute it is actually an important part of being able to refute those who contradict. It's an important part of equipping yourself to be a pastor and an elder. Of course, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 to do the work of an evangelist, 2 Timothy 2, and then in 2 Timothy 4 to preach the word faithfully. In 1 Peter 3.15, Peter tells his readers to be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. So the command to be an evangelist, to be an apologist, to make a defense for the truth pervades the New Testament. And we see that command lived out in the first generations of church history. And their example then becomes significant for us in the 21st century of church history because we too are to make a defense for the hope that is in us. We too are to refute those who contradict and to exhort in sound doctrine and to evangelize a lost world that has been clouded by error. So I think today's lecture is extremely practical. It's also very practical and profitable because there are so many parallels between the early heretical groups and modern day cults and false religions. There is a sense in which Satan doesn't come up with new ideas. He just regurgitates old ideas and gives them new labels. And I think you'll start to see that as we go through the lecture today. So we have then kind of a survey of some of the ancient errors and the roots of what I call the modern cult groups. And we'll see that parallel take place as we go through this material uh, some of these errors will show up again in your reading, especially in the book by Stephen Nichols, For Us and For Our Salvation, because he takes the time to demonstrate how the, some of the early Christological heresies in particular forced the church to clearly articulate what it understood the apostles and the New Testament to be teaching, again, grounding their doctrine in the scriptures. We come first to a group known as the Ebionites, or Ebionism. The Ebionites are really the theological descendants of the Judaizers. And we, of course, are familiar with the Judaizers because they plague the church in the book of Acts. And they were the primary opponents of Paul and Barnabas even at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. The Judaizers, of course, was a group of former Jews, Jewish followers, if I can put that in quotes, of Jesus Christ, who wanted to have Jesus Christ as their Messiah, but they did not want to give up the legalistic restrictions of the Mosaic Law. They wanted to force Christians to follow the dietary restrictions of the Mosaic Law, to really follow all of the um, ceremonial aspects of the Mosaic Law, and, of course, to require Christians to be circumcised. They did not like, for obvious reasons, they did not like the Apostle Paul. They opposed the ministry of the Apostle Paul during his own lifetime, and they continued to reject Pauline teachings even after the Apostle Paul was executed. And in spite of the fact that James and Peter and all of the other apostles affirmed the teachings of the Apostle Paul. You have James, of course, affirming Paul in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council. You have Paul's own record of those events in Galatians chapter 1, where James and John and Peter affirmed Paul's teaching. And you have Peter's affirmation of Paul in 2 Peter chapter 3, where Peter clearly says that Paul's writings are on par with the rest of the scriptures. So there, there is no division between the apostles and Paul, even though there is a division between the Judaizers and Paul, and that's because the Judaizers want to introduce the works of the law into the gospel. The Ebonites 
as a distinct group, as a descendant group of the Judaizers, are first mentioned in the second century. Most of what we know of them comes from the early church fathers who wrote polemics against them. Justin Martyr is one who tells us that the Ebionites believed that the law of Moses was obligatory for all Christians. Irenaeus, in his five-volume work against heresies, is the first to use the term Ebionite, which most historians believe comes from the Hebrew word that means poor, that these were those who were destitute doctrinally in some way, probably a play on words that the early church fathers took. These were probably people who took some sort of vow of poverty, and the early church fathers turned that on them to say that they were not only materially poor, but also spiritually destitute. They denied the deity of Jesus, they denied the Trinity, they denied the virgin birth, and they denied substitutionary atonement. So this is not just a minor defection from biblical orthodoxy. They ascribe to what is known as adoptionism, the idea that Jesus became the Son of God at his baptism, that when the Holy Spirit descended upon him, that was when he became the Son of God. And they also held to an altered gospel according to the Hebrews, some people have thought that that may have been some sort of edited Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew, but we don't really have any hard evidence to support that theory. It wouldn't make much sense for them to hold to the full Gospel of Matthew since the Gospel of Matthew begins with the virgin birth, a doctrine which the Ebionites rejected. So right out of the gate, you have really legalism versus grace as it pertains to the gospel and you have the gospel of grace versus the gospel of works which we saw already played out at the Jerusalem council where in Acts chapter 15 the gospel of grace was upheld by the apostles and James even says in his speech there that it's the Holy Spirit who was the one who ultimately made that decision and it wasn't in any way a change, but rather a affirmation of what the gospel had always been. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think they didn't stand on for like two or three hundred years because um, one of their point, I don't know if you got to it yet, but the denial of the Trinity was it, what, it, it wasn't formulated until right until the Council of Nazi. Yeah, we're going to have some other groups that are going to really call the trinitarian issue into question uh, but you're you're asking i think a broader question about were there was there more propensity among some of these early groups to deny the trinity because the trinity hadn't been clearly articulated yet as a doctrine and i think there is some truth to that though we do have i believe among the orthodox church fathers clear affirmations of Trinitarian truths, even though the articulation of that doctrine has not, or maybe I should say it this way, the articulation of that doctrine will become much more clear at the Council of Nicaea, even though the affirmation of those truths exists in the centuries before the Council of Nicaea and goes all the way back to the New Testament itself. Um, but perhaps there was some level of ambiguity that enabled some of these cult groups to, uh, to gain a hearing. Though the reality is, even after the Council of Nicaea, there are still cult groups that deny the Trinity. So denying the Trinity didn't go away just because the Council of Nicaea articulated it more clearly. Um, and again, to reiterate what I was saying earlier, our understanding of the Trinity is not based on the Council of Nicaea. It's based on the New Testament. And those New Testament truths are affirmed clearly before the Council of Nicaea, even if they're not articulated as neatly as they will be later. 
Yeah, Jim. I was going to say that in Acts chapter 18, that you mentioned, that the Ebionites were the one who's preaching the works over grace. That they started in that. Uh, Oh, absolutely. The Ebionites were the ones who were preaching works over grace. Now, when we look at the New Testament, we're going to refer to the opponents of Paul at the Jerusalem Council as the Judaizers. And the Ebionites we would see as a subsequent movement that took kind of the core teachings of the Judaizers and becomes their second and third century descendants. So... Right, so this is the Judaizers now in the second and third century of church history. Yeah? Was there one main proponent of Ebionism that showed up later on? Can we find one main guy that was kind of driving it I mean, after the Judaizers? Before? Well, was there one main proponent of Ebionism who, who shows up later in church history? No, I don't, not that I'm aware of. And most of what we know about the Ebionites actually comes from Orthodox church leaders who are writing apologetics against what the Ebionites were teaching. So our knowledge of Ebionism is a little bit limited because we don't have a lot of first-hand writings from the Ebionites themselves. We have the responses of the church to their false teachings. And actually, we were in a similar position with Gnosticism for a long time until in the 20th century some original Gnostic documents were discovered, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we do see Ebionism show up again, though. Ironically, we find it in both the apostate form of Roman Catholicism, where they begin to emphasize certain works as being necessary for salvation. That is a legalistic concept, which is similar to what the Judaizers and then the Ebionites were propounding and purporting. We also see it in some of the modern cult groups, in particular the Seventh-day Adventists, who, when we get to the, let me just preface this by saying, when we get to the 18th, uh, really the 19th century, the 1800s in American history, we're going to have a revival in the church that's known as the Second Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening is not only a time of revival for the church, the true church, it's also a time of just general, what is called spiritual awakening, that actually spins off a lot of bad movements as well. It's uh, a time in American history that is known as restorationism. There are a number of groups in the 19th century that believed that they were kind of the first groups in all of church history to get it right. And a number of false teachers, using that as their argument, began to teach brand new doctrines that they claimed were actually lost doctrines that they had recovered. So it's known as restorationism. Among the restorationist groups, we have the Church of Christ, like the L.A. Church of Christ or the Boston Church of Christ. We have the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, which actually was a spinoff of the Church of Christ, Joseph Smith and the Mormons. We have the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, William Miller and Ellen G. White. We have the Jehovah's Witnesses in the early 20th century. And also, as part of that restorationist group, we have Pentecostalism. All of these groups claimed that they had somehow recovered primitive Christianity. And interestingly enough, when they do that, we see these ancient heresies showing up again in American history. So we have the Ebionites showing up again, really in a hybrid form, in the Seventh-day Adventists. Because the Seventh-day Adventists are a restorationist group that is claiming that you have to keep certain aspects of the Mosaic law in order to be saved. So dietary laws are suddenly reintroduced, keeping the Sabbath is reintroduced, and other aspects of ceremonial Judaism are injected into American Christianity in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. So, uh, and we'll see the parallels with some of those other re restorationist groups as we work our way through here. 
did the Church of Christ rather come out of the disciples of Christ? Um, did you know? You know what? I don't know. I would need to go back and, and do a little bit more research on the Disciples of Christ denomination in particular. Uh, but there were a whole number of new denominations that were formed as offshoots of some of these cult groups. So I would need to go back and look on that one. Okay, so we have kind of the ancient legalists in the movement of Ebionism. Let's move on then to Gnosticism. There was already in the first century a false teaching about the nature of Jesus Christ that we call Docetism. D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M. Docetism. It comes from a word that means to appear or, uh, or an appearance. Docetism taught that Jesus Christ did not take on a literal physical body, but that rather he was only an illusion. He only had the appearance of a physical body. Docetism fit, fit very nicely within Greco-Roman philosophy, especially Platonism, because Plato had taught that this physical world is only an inferior reflection of true, superior, pure, spiritual principles that stood outside of physical reality. Docetism then, taking that Greek dualism, taught that matter is inferior, matter is even evil, and only the spiritual is actually good. So the spiritual is superior, and the material is inferior. Matter is evil, and the spiritual is good. Based on that Greek dualistic way of viewing the world, they taught that Jesus could not have had a literal physical body because that would have meant that he was actually in some way contaminated by the evil that this physical world represents. Jesus could not have been contaminated, therefore he did not have a real physical body, therefore his body was only an illusion, it was an appearance. Well, this becomes a problem already in the first century. We've mentioned 1 John 4 before in this class, but in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, really, but verses 1 through 5 in particular, the Apostle John says that the way that you can determine between the true spirit of God and a false spirit, the spirit of a false prophet, spirit of Antichrist, is whether or not the prophet teaches that Jesus came in the literal flesh or whether he did not come in the flesh. We look at that and we say, what, what's the big deal? Uh, the big deal is that there were false prophets, advocates of docetism, running around claiming that Jesus did not actually come as a true human being. That, in essence, denies the incarnation, and to deny the incarnation is to deny, really, an essential component of the gospel, because if Christ is to die as a sacrificial lamb for sin, it must be a real death, not an illusory death, and... If he is to be a mediator between God and man, he must be a real man. So interestingly enough, it is the humanity of Christ, which is the first major Christological heresy, not the deity of Christ. Yeah, the Ebionites did deny the deity of Christ to some extent, but the deity of Christ will come under attack much later in the 4th century under Arianism. It's really the humanity of Christ which is first attacked in church history. Docetism is one of the primary components of Gnosticism. So there's the connection. Gnosticism does not fully develop until the 2nd and 3rd century, even though Docetism was already around in the 1st century. Many, many different forms of Gnosticism. Gnosticism was unified by the fact that the teachers of the Gnostics believed that they had some sort of special knowledge or secret knowledge by which they imparted salvation to their hearers. In Gnosticism, the gospel was not about being saved from sin. It was about being saved from, really, the evil inherent in this physical universe 
Salvation was not by redemption. Salvation was by knowledge. If you had the secret knowledge, then after you died, you could escape from this physical world. You could ascend through what they called the aeons of the spiritual world, often by having some sort of secret password or secret code. The secret knowledge would gain you access to the higher levels or planes of existence. If it sounds kind of new age, it was very new age. It depicted creation as a mythological struggle between competing forces of light and darkness. Again, that Greek dualism. The physical was seen as bad, the material was seen as evil, and the spiritual was seen as good. The Gnostics believed in a supreme and unknowable monadic divinity and the introduction by emanation of further divine beings. And so you had one initial intelligence of some sort who then produced another god, who produced other gods, who produced other gods, and eventually you have this long chain or pantheon of these gods who range in hierarchy. Brian Lipfin, and you'll, in fact, you already did read some of this, but I'm just going to read it again to point out a few things. He talks about Gnosticism. He says the term Gnostic is derived from the Greek word for gnosis. Gnosticism was not a coherent or uniform set of beliefs. Rather, it was an array of movements that shared many common tendencies. Central to Gnosticism is the belief that the sex, sacred texts and teachers could provide access to secret knowledge about how the universe really operates. One aspect of Gnosticism was its teaching known as docetism, and we just discussed that. What exactly did the Gnostics believe? Now, this was on his chapter on Irenaeus. Irenaeus was one of the great opponents of Gnosticism, in particular Valentinian Gnosticism, which was one specific version of Gnostic belief. Their myths seem so ridiculous to us today that we can scarcely believe anyone would ever have embraced them. But we must acknowledge that for many ancient people, Gnosticism offered an attractive alternative to Orthodox Christianity. And for the record, there are some things that intelligent people believe today that if the Lord were to tarry another 2,000 years, future generations of Christians and scholars would believe the myths embraced by many today are so ridiculous that they would find them unbelievable. I think evolution, uh, Darwinian evolution, certainly fits in that category. But we must acknowledge that for many ancient people, Gnosticism offered an attractive alternative to Orthodox Christianity. Spiritual seekers were drawn to its seeming intellectualism and mysterious insights into the cosmos. For example, the Valentinian Gnostics believed that there was a heavenly fullness which consisted of 30 angelic beings called aeons. The aeons always came in male-female pairs. These conjugal pairs emitted lower aeons, and the last of these emissions was Sophia. But Sophia, in spite of being wisdom, made a foolish choice. She became passionate and wickedly longed for the highest father apart from her own consort. Though she was eventually healed from her grievous action, her evil thought, which had given rise to her sin, was cast out of the fullness like an aborted fetus. This shapeless thought took on a personified form named Mother Akamoth. She was in a hopeless state until the Christ came to her and enabled Akamoth to bring forth substances from within herself. One of these beings she brought forth was the Demiurge. He was the ignorant creator of the entire physical world in which we live. In many Gnostic accounts, the Demiurge was equated with Yahweh, the Jewish God of the Old Testament who foolishly thought he was the one true God. Only the enlightened Gnostics knew he was actually a corrupted being far inferior to the goddess Sophia. Okay, so this is, to use a technical term, pretty wacky. I don't know, crazy, bizarre. There were a lot of terms going through my mind. In order to give secret wisdom to the spiritual Gnostics, the Demiurge is said to have given birth to a son who was filled with the spiritual seed of Mother Akamoth. The son was the Christ who passed through Mary without taking a body from her. He was just like water flowing through a tube. The Gnostics often said the Christ inhabited the body of the man, Jesus of Nazareth, but that his body was not made of real flesh. The docetic Christ who possessed the illusion of a body came into the world to teach spiritual precepts that only the enlightened Gnostics would be able to comprehend. 
Through the purging action of his revealed knowledge, the Gnostics would eventually make their way up into the fullness as purified spirits. So there you go. There's one particular strand of Gnosticism. This is the Gnosticism that Irenaeus in particular wrote against in his five-volume work against heresies. But you can see that this is incredibly anti-Christian, anti-biblical, and the Christians were very quickly forced to defend true doctrine against that which is, to use Paul's term, falsely called knowledge, the Gnostics. Now, I have a page in here about Mormonism as modern-day Gnosticism, and there are some striking parallels between Gnosticism and Mormonism, there are also some striking parallels between the rise of Islam and the rise of Mormonism, but we won't get to those until we get to the 7th century. Harold Bloom, in his work, The American Religion, makes this case. He says, Mormonism is a purely American gnosis for which Joseph Smith was and is a far more crucial figure than Jesus could be. And he talks about how, even before that, the God of Joseph Smith is a daring revival of the God of some of the Kabbalists and Gnostics, prophetic sages who, like Smith himself, asserted that they had returned to the true religion. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about this being part of the restorationist movement in American history, where in the 19th century, as a result, really as a spinoff of the Second Great Awakening, a number of false teachers claimed to have recovered pure religion. One of those was Joseph Smith, claimed, of course, that through the special revelation of the angel Moroni and also other angelic revelations from Gabriel and others, that he had been given new revelation, which was going to return the church to its purity since the church had been corrupt for all of the centuries of church history. The result of that, of course, is the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Doctrines and Covenants. But there are a lot of interesting similarities between the Gnostics and the Mormons. <clears throat> Here a um, quote from Lance Owens actually going to uh, one of Joseph Smith's discourses, the King Follett Discourse, which he gave just 10 weeks before his death. I'll read this paragraph. This is quoting from Joseph Smith. There are but very few beings in the world who, write, who understand rightly the character of God. If men do not comprehend the character of God, they do not comprehend their own character. So he's setting up the case that there's only a few people who really understand the truth. And he's one of the few, of course. Within humankind, there is an immortal spark of intelligence, taught the prophet, a seed of divine intellect or light, which is as immortal as and co-equal with God himself. So, like the Gnostics, there's a spark of divinity within you, taught Joseph Smith. Turning to Hebrew and an oddly Kabbalistic exegesis of the first three words of Genesis... Smith pronounced there are a multitude of gods who emanated from the first god. Well, that sounds a lot like the fullness who then had emanations called aeons. Existing one above the other without end. He who humankind calls God was himself once a man. And man, by advancing in intelligence, knowledge, consciousness, may be exalted with God and become as God. And so you have in Mormon teaching the idea that God the Father produced in some sort of reproductive way God the Son, and some sort of reproduction that involved Mary. That sounds a lot like the Gnostic teaching of how Christ came into the world. And you also have the idea that after death, salvation consists of one day becoming a God yourself, and interestingly, in Gnosticism, to uh, these aeons, these emanations of deities, existed as male-female conjugal pairs that then could produce other divine beings. And you have in Mormonism as well, the teaching that there will be some sort of heavenly marriage 
in which human beings who have now been elevated to divine status can populate their own universes in some sort of heavenly marital way. So a lot of connections between Gnosticism and Mormonism, along with connections between Islam and Mormonism, which we'll talk about later. And I've given these quotes here just to show that I'm not the only one who has shown some of these connections. Yep, Rich. Are these both secular authors? I think Bloom is. Yeah, they are secular authors. But Christian apologists have also been quick to show the parallels between ancient Gnosticism and Mormonism. in the ancient church of secular authors stepping forward and giving an apology for Christianity, or not so much? Uh, not so much. We do have secular authors who come forward and will give credence to the historical claims that Christians rely on. So the historical facts of the crucifixion and of details in the gospel and of the persecution that Christians faced and so on, those details are affirmed by both Christian and secular sources. Now, we can believe them just because they're in the Bible, of course. That's our authority. So we don't look to the secular sources to authorize biblical details, but they do affirm biblical details and give us a bigger picture of some of the historical data that exists in the background. Um, one other thought about Mormonism, and if you guys are interested in doing your project on Mormonism next semester, it is an interesting study. Uh, Joseph Smith also had connections to Freemasonry, and Freemasonry is also very Gnostic. It's all about secret knowledge and secret handshakes and secret codes and everything else. And as you progress up the levels of Freemasonry, uh, it's, I think, symbolic of even some sort of salvation. So you do have Freemasonry ties with Joseph Smith, historical connections there, and of course connections between Gnosticism and Freemasonry. Yep? Can I a big comment of families, like big, big families? That, it seems like that's connected with what you were saying about these deities being able to reproduce uh, their own universes. Yeah, well, in terms of Mormonism's uh, family values. The family values of Mormonism has actually been something that has evolved. Mormonism itself has greatly evolved from when it began in the early 1800s under Joseph Smith. Uh, in fact, there are historical records, I was just doing some research on this yesterday, historical records from Joseph Smith and some of the other original elders in the 1830s that they spoke in tongues and prophesied and had visions and very much were like the Pentecostals 75 years before Pentecostalism comes on the scene. But Mormonism has since kind of moved away from that. Other things that they've moved away from, the Mormons were initially quite violent. The Mormons, of course, were polygamous at their beginnings. And those are things that modern day Mormonism has tried to move away from as it's tried to position itself as not a false religion, but just another denomination of evangelicalism. You know, and, and leading the way in that, of course, is uh, guys like Richard Mao, who is the president of uh, Fuller Theological Seminary, who just this year published a book called Talking with Mormons, an Invitation to Evangelicals. So, no, he's the president of Fuller Theological Seminary. So he's, he's not a Mormon but he thinks the Mormons are worth opening dialogue with. Since I'm being recorded, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I disagree with that approach. Uh, a couple different uh, distinct offshoots of Gnosticism that you need to be aware, with, aware of. We talked about the Valentinian Gnostics. Um, a little bit later, after the development of Gnosticism, one of the more well-known Gnostic teachers, especially dangerous to the early church, was a guy named Marcion. Marcionism is really a subset of Gnosticism. Marcion was the son of a Christian bishop. So 
you have in Marcion a very clear attempt to synthesize Orthodox Christianity with certain aspects of Gnosticism because he himself had grown up in an Orthodox Christian family, the son of a bishop who now turns to become a cult leader. Marcion taught that the teachings of Christ were incompatible with the God of the Old Testament. And in much the same way that you have new atheists today like Richard Dawkins running around saying that the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and he's incompatible with the God of the New Testament who's a God of love, Marcion was doing that same thing in the second century. He tried to make the case that the God of the Old Testament was wrathful and judgmental and vengeful and evil, and the God of the New Testament, whom he called the Heavenly Father, was a God of love and mercy and kindness and grace. And Jesus came, or Christ came, to save the world from the God of the Old Testament, and he was sent by the God of the New Testament. Uh, this kind of... Um, false dichotomy between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament was rejected, of course, by the Orthodox Church, and rightly so, but it was what was one of the primary emphases of Marcionism. And as you saw from Brian Lipton's discussion about Gnosticism, that fit very well within a Gnostic paradigm. Now, the irony, of course, is when you study the Old Testament... God himself in the Old Testament describes himself as a God of loving kindness and compassion and grace and mercy, and in fact is described more often in the Old Testament as a God of loving kindness than anything else. And in the New Testament, the God of the New Testament is described as a God of judgment and a God who hates sin and a God who punishes evildoers and sends unbelievers to hell and uh, so you have the biblical data that balances out the fact that the God of the Old Testament is exactly the same as the God of the New Testament. And of course, you guys know that. But it's interesting that here in the second century, Marcion is trying to divide the Old Testament from the New Testament. He sees the Old Testament as a Jewish document that needs to be rejected and only the New Testament as a Christian doc document that needs to be embraced. But even in his New Testament, he wants to cut out a whole bunch of the New Testament. Well, of course he has to cut out a whole bunch of the New Testament because you can't reject the Old Testament without cutting out most of your New Testament. He leaves in the Gospel of Luke. He leaves in the epistles of Paul. And even there, he has to take scissors to most of what, or at least much of what Luke writes and much of what Paul writes. Anything that's positive about the Old Testament, he cuts out of his Bible. Which leaves him with not much of a Bible and really just mostly his own wrong ideas. Another form of Gnosticism, this in the third century, is Manichaeanism. Mani, M-A-N-I, is his name. Um, Mani, or Manichaeus, which is the Latinized form of his name. He attempted to synthesize, kind of under a Gnostic umbrella, all sorts of religions, Christianity and Zoroastrianism and Gnosticism being the three primary influences. And as a result, he developed a... You know, he developed a form of religion that had elements of all of these other religions, but none of, you know, the end result was entirely contaminated. False doctrine, you've probably heard this uh, metaphor used before, but false doctrine is a lot like a, or false religion is often a lot like a, um, a glass of water that has had poison added to it especially when it comes to synthesizing religions together. So you take a little bit of truth and you add the poison of false teaching to it, and the end result is that the entire thing is contaminated and becomes poisonous. That's certainly the case with Manichaeanism. 
Manichaeanism was ca uh, characterized by that dualism that we'd already talked about with regard to Gnosticism. This was something that was very prominent in Zoroastrianism, something that is still prominent in certain Eastern religions where you have kind of the yin and yang, the dark and the light, these two competing forces that are always present within the universe. So there is two realms, the realm of light and the realm of darkness. The realm of light is good and peaceful. The realm of darkness is evil and in chaos. And the current state of the universe is explained by an attack from the realm of darkness on the creation of an emanation from the realm of light. Manny taught that there is no omnipotent power of good, but rather a dualistic struggle between good and evil. And... Um, in each person, the good part wars against the bad part. And in some ways, the theology of Star Wars is really represented in ancient Manichaeanism, which is seen in New Age philosophy throughout all of church history. Yep? Do they believe there will ever be an end to evil? Or do they think it's just going to keep going with this constant war? Yeah, you know, I don't know what their understanding of cosmological kind of eschatology would be, like where the universe is ultimately heading. I think they were more focused, Manichaeanism was more focused on where the individual is going to end up. And for them, individual salvation came from identifying yourself with the, you know, with the good side of the force rather than the bad side of the force. You know, so Anakin can be saved even if Darth Vader can't. Well, he did throw the emperor overboard, didn't he? All right, a, a new kind of heresy started to develop in the second century as well. And uh, this is where we get into our connections with the Trinity that we're being asked about earlier, monarchianism. Uh, monarchianism taught that God exists as a singular ruler. So the idea of monarch, king, there's only one king, monarchianism. And so it conflicted with the doctrine of the Trinity and was then rejected by the church as heretical. There are two types of monarchianism. Monarchianism essentially says there's only one God, therefore the Trinity cannot be true. And uh, monarchianism had two different forms. One was known as modalism, and the other as adoptionism. Adoptionism we've already talked about a little bit because it was something that characterized the teaching of the Ebionites. It was the idea that Jesus was not the Son of God when he was born. He was not eternally God, but he became the Son of God, a lower rank from God himself. He became the Son of God at either his baptism or his ascension. He was adopted as the Son of God at one of those two points in his life. That's adoptionism, clearly a denial of the Trinity, a denial of really the deity of Jesus Christ, a denial of his full equality as the Son of God with the Father. Modalism was championed by a priest named Sabellius, which is why modalism is sometimes called Sabellianism, after the guy who was really its earliest champion. Modalism teaches that there's one God, but sometimes he shows up as different people, different uh, manifestations. Manifestation or mode are the terms that they use. Modalists avoid the term person when referring to God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. In particular, modalists generally teach that in the Old Testament, God was in the mode of the Father. In the Gospels, God was in the mode of the Son, and in the church age, God is in the mode of the Holy Spirit. And uh, this view was called by the church fathers Patripassianism, because it essentially taught that God the Father, who was at that point in the mode of the Son, was the one who died on the cross. Modalism still exists today, in particular, in a group known as Oneness Pentecostalism. 
Oneness Pentecostalism uh, teaches modalism. And uh, it is a, uh, certainly not a majority, but a fairly significant segment of modern day Pentecostalism. Oneness Pentecostalism became a point of conversation among conservative evangelicals this last year when James McDonald, I've mentioned this already, but when James McDonald invited T.D. Jakes to come to the Elephant Room Conference, uh, modalism suddenly became a major topic of interest because T.D. Jakes has historically been associated with oneness Pentecostal groups. Now, there's still, I think, some uncertainty as to where T.D. Jakes exactly is in his teaching on the Trinity. Those who have studied his past associations clearly see lines of ambiguity in his teaching and uh, lines of cooperation with oneness Pentecostal groups, even though at the Elephant Room, T.D. Jakes seem to kind of verbalize an agreement with some rudimentary aspects of Trinitarianism. So I'll let you guys figure that all out for yourselves. Uh, I did, if you're really interested in it, I did write a blog article on modalism, oneness theology, and T.D. Jakes back in September of last year, and you can find that on the Cripplegate blog if you're really interested in getting deeper into T.D. Jakes' modalism. Historically, uh, the modalists were rejected because not only did they teach that essentially God the Father had been the one who suffered on the cross, but they denied the individual personhood of, or the distinct personhood of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There are some really big problems with modalism when you compare it to what the scriptures teach. For example, at the baptism of Christ, you have all three members of the Trinity present. Well, that doesn't work in a modalist system since God cannot simultaneously be all three members. He has to be one or the other at a time. So how could the Father be in heaven and the Spirit descending as a dove and the Son in the water at Christ's baptism if... God is limited to only one mode at any given time. Who was Christ praying to when he prayed to the Father? The modalist has to essentially affirm that Christ was praying to himself, but that doesn't fit the biblical record. Um, that even the Trinitarian formula used for baptism in uh, Matthew 28, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now the modalist will say, well, the word name is singular, but that only speaks to the unity of the Godhead. It doesn't deny the distinct personhood of each member of the Godhead. Yes? What would the scriptures say about the atonement where, I mean, I, I understand what, that they would say, okay, God is existing as the Son in this case, but with scripture references that, that say, the, you know, Isaiah 53, it's the Father who crushed the, the serpent. What, what would they say about that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know how they would answer that question. Um, other popular forms of modalism today, uh, a name you would probably recognize, is the Christian singing group Phillips, Craig, and Dean, um, which probably, if you've listened to them, you probably enjoy some of their songs. They are each oneness Pentecostal pastors, so they are part of oneness Pentecostalism. I, I like to use them as an example because... I've, I've found it to be very ironic that you have, with Phillips, Craig, and Dean, one band, three <laughs> singers. So how it is that uh, they can't get the Trinity right, I don't know. Um, but mo modalism was denounced by the church and uh, considered to be heretical and uh, those who were modalists were excommunicated by Orthodox Christians. Yes? Uh, do the, the ancient modalists share some of the other heresies that modern day uh, uh, oneness Pentecostalism? Well, oneness Pentecostalism, 
because it's Pentecostal, uh, it shares more in common with Montanism, which is the next uh, issue that we'll talk about here. It's distinct among Pentecostals because to their Montanism, they've added modalism. And um, so they've, they've taken something that I think already was heretical, or at least unorthodox, and they've added to it something that definitely is heretical in a denial of the Trinity. Yeah? So when people see that the gospel, when they say, oh, God sent himself as Jesus, how can we say that without confusing it as modalism? Well, I think a better way to say it is just to use the language of Scripture in places like John 3.16, that God sent his Son. And, and yet we see in Scripture that the Son is God. He claimed to be God. He defended that claim. And he is worshipped as God. He's prayed to as God. And he is revered as God throughout the Scriptures. So, the, you know, the Bible doesn't use the word <laughs> Trinity, and yet the Bible clearly presents the dual truths that are affirmed by the doctrine of the Trinity. On the one hand, there is only one God. On the other hand, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and yet the Son is not the Father, the Spirit is not the Father, the Spirit is not the Son. There is distinct personhood, and yet there's only one God. So how do we... How do we harmonize those truths? Well, ultimately, we don't. We just believe them to be true because they are both presented as being true in the Scriptures. And we rest in the fact that they are harmonized in the mind of God. The modalists couldn't handle what they felt was um, a discrepancy between these two truths. They couldn't handle the tension. And so they denied one in order to give precedence to the other. And when Arius comes along, he's going to do the same thing. He says, Scripture teaches there's only one God, therefore Jesus can't be equal to the Father. Well, no. Scripture teaches there's only one God, and Scripture teaches that Jesus is equal to the Father. All right, Montanism. Uh, Montanism was known in its own day as the New Prophecy, and it was named after its founder, Montanus, who traveled around Asia Minor with some female prophetesses. And uh, he proclaimed that there was a new era of history, the age of the paraclete, which was his way of referencing the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit gave direct revelation to him through these prophetesses, and that this revelation was binding on the church. So he had new prophecy. Uh, The Montanists were characterized by ecstasy, spiritual ecstasy, ecstatic experiences, certainly ecstatic forms of prophecy. Some would even suggest maybe some form of speaking in tongues, though I think the historical record is a little bit ambiguous on that point. And it's because of those spiritual experiences that some modern-day Pentecostals and Charismatics have looked back to the Montanists as being one of their ancient predecessors. The reason the Montanists were rejected, ultimately, is because Montanus claimed that his new prophecy was authoritative and binding on the church, and that those who did not submit to these new revelations were in error, Unlike modern, <clears throat> unlike modern charismatics who uh, claim that there's new forms of prophecy but often deny the fact that they're somehow binding on the life of the church. So the Montanists were distinct, I suppose, in that regard. They claimed that Jesus was going to be coming back very, very soon and that he would be establishing his kingdom in a new Jerusalem. And uh, all of this led to Montanism's rejection. Um, <clears throat> Nicholas Needham gives a few different reasons for the rejection of Montanism, and I just want to look at these quickly. So I'll shift over 
This is on page 109 of his first volume of 2,000 Years of Christ's Power. He says, the Catholic Church, and he's using the word Catholic again, not in the sense of Roman Catholic, but in the sense of the universal Catholic Church, Catholicos, the Greek term that means universal. The Catholic Church condemned and excommunicated the Montanists. Why? He gives four reasons. Broadly speaking, ordinary Christians were highly suspicious of the Montanist prophecies, visions, speaking in tongues, cult of martyrdom, and the general state of religious intensity and enthusiasm. To Catholic Christians, Montanists seemed like spiritual drunkards. And uh, that certainly fits the way that many evangelicals think about the Pentecostal, charismatic, and neo-charismatic movements. Number two, the claim of Montanists, Priscilla and Maximilla, those were his prophetesses, to be indwelt by the paraclete in fulfillment of John 14, 16, and 16, 12, and 13 raised serious problems. And he goes on to explain, I won't read it here, but that the early church understood the fulfillment of Christ's prophecy in John 14, 15, and 16 to be fulfilled in the apostles, not to be fulfilled in a post-apostolic era whereas Montanus was using that to claim that he was authoritative and inspired. And in fact, when he would prophesy from the Holy Spirit, he wouldn't say the Holy Spirit says this. He would use first-person language. I am the Holy Spirit, and I am telling you to do this, which freaked people out, and rightly so. Uh, number three, many of the Montanus prophecies did not come true. There's another parallel to modern Pentecostalism. For example, we remember that Maximilla prophesied, after me there will be no more prophecy but the end. Maximilla died in 179, and the end did not come. Such things weakened the credibility of all Montanist prophets and their utterances. Well, yeah, just like Pat Robertson. All right, I'll stop. I'm being recorded. i got to remember that. <laughs> I guess he gives more than four reasons. He gives six. The Catholic Church criti fathers criticized the way that Montanist prophets were supposedly taken over by the Holy Spirit when they prophesied. For example, one unnamed Catholic leader condemned Montanist prophets for going into trances and speaking in a state of unnatural ecstasy, after which all restraint is thrown into the wind. This experience of possession, in which the prophet lost self-control, was not how the Holy Spirit work, he ar worked, he argued, it conflicted with the practice of the church. And that, again, is a parallel to the modern Pentecostal movement. I was just reading a couple weeks ago um, uh, a Pentecostal man in Africa was writing a opinion editorial piece about what was happening in his own African Pentecostal churches. Uh, he was in uh, Ghana, and he was talking about how these people are supposedly possessed by the Holy Spirit, and yet they're acting like lunatics. And in one case, one lady who was possessed by the Holy Spirit fell into a boy who was possessed by the Holy Spirit and knocked him over and cut his lip. And the author writing this piece is asking the question, how in the world could that be the Holy Spirit if he's knocking into himself uh, in, in states of spiritual ecstasy? So, again, parallels. Uh, number five, the Montanists condemned other Christians as unspiritual if they would not embrace the new prophecy. And it's similar to how Pentecostals today uh, assert that anyone who has not experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit is unspiritual. And then number six, some Montanists fell into the Sabellian heresy, which taught that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were not three different persons, and that parallels the oneness Pentecostal movement today. So again, you have a lot of parallels in church history between these ancient heretical groups and modern movements. Now, Montanism is perhaps treated more favorably by some in the early church than some of these other heretical groups like the Gnostics and the Ebionites. And yet, for the most part, the mainstream church rejected Montanism as being false. Now, Montanism was helpful to the church in the sense that once somebody came along and claimed to have new authoritative prophecy, Christians got motivated to collect and uh, continue the process of canonicity because they needed apostolic writings to be widely distributed 
so that they could refute the claims of Montanism on the basis of the authority of the apostles. Just like all these other heretical groups, it forces the church to become more clear, more articulate in its defense of doctrine. Would uh, Montanists ever say that they were at an apostolic level in their prophecies? I don't know that Montanists claimed to specifically be an apostle, but he certainly claimed that his prophecy was on the same level of authority as what had been taught by the apostles, because he kind of bypassed the apostles and said, look, I'm actually teaching the very words of the Holy Spirit. So he claimed to be inspired, which immediately raises the need for a canon, because we need to recognize what is truly inspired and what's not. prophecies on the same level as like because it makes sense to me if you really are getting prophecy you go to that logical conclusion that you went to why don't they do that today yeah why do reformed charismatics not put their prophecy on the same level as um, biblical prophecy or as inspired authoritative prophecy that we see in the new testament and in the old testament and the answer is because if you're reformed then you hold to the doctrine of sola scriptura. And if you hold to the doctrine of sola scriptura, you have to hold to a closed canon. So any prophecy that you claim to receive cannot add to the scriptures. Therefore, it cannot be authoritative in the same way as the scriptures. So the reformed part of your question mitigates the charismatic part of your question. But I think your question is a good question. I think it points to one of the major weaknesses in the Pentecostal view. Jim, last question. Yeah, I'm curious about the end of this uh, leaders. Is there any one who uh, burned at stake because of their position? Because Polycarp is uh, teaching the right doctrine and then he ended up. Well, uh, the Roman government didn't differentiate between true Christians and cultic Christians. And... Uh, you did have examples. Uh, in fact, Needham talks about this in his book. You do have examples of times where Montanists are going to be imprisoned and martyred, just as Orthodox Christians are going to be imprisoned and martyred. He even says you could have a Montanist and an Orthodox Christian sharing the same prison cell if they're awaiting their execution. So, yes. Now, when you read in Brian Lipfin's Walking with the, or Getting to Know the Church Fathers, when you get to Priscilla and Felicity, and when you get to Tertullian, this is going to become an issue again because they were Montanists. And the Orthodox Church regarded them as heretics, but a lot of modern scholars want to treat them a lot more friendly than we treat the other heretical groups. Part of that is motivated out of the history, since it seems like maybe they were treated a little bit differently, but a lot of that is motivated out of contemporary events where we want to be more friendly towards Pentecostalism and Pentecostalism finds it, its parallels in ancient history in the Montanist movement. All right, all right one, one more little question. What did Tertullian see in Montanism? Why, why did he convert? What did Tertullian see in Montanism? Why did he convert to Montanism? Tertullian was frustrated at the Orthodox Church, in particular Clement of Alexandria, because Clement wanted to see Orthodox Christianity embrace and imbibe Greek philosophy and Greek culture. Tertullian saw that as a corruption of the church. He saw that as worldliness. The Montanists were extremely strict and aesthetic uh, in their um, practice. They forbid all sorts of things that they consider to be worldliness. In a sense, it parallels Pentecostalism again because Pentecostalism comes out of the Wesleyan holiness movement, which was very, very strict, almost legalistic. So were the Montanists. And Tertullian, in rejecting what he saw as worldly compromise among Orthodox Christians, swung the pendulum to the other extreme and embraced a movement that he saw as being extremely strict and moralistic, and he wanted that. 